Who fucking cares? Superheroes are known for being the absolute pillars of moral righteousness, but sometimes even they flip over to the dark side. Of course, I'm not talking about fake icons like Homelander, who only masquerade as the harbingers of peace and justice. Honestly though, I don't really need to count him, because even the purest of souls can kill if the situation demands it. And that's exactly what we're here to explore, as the TV region brings to you the top 25 times when superheroes killed in films and TV. No! You thought you could escape me! Rocket Raccoon. Now, before you say anything, I'd just like to say that I don't endorse the killing of people, but to watch the higher evolutionary meters end at the hands of Rocket Raccoon and the Guardians was definitely satisfying. James Gunn may be the new face of DC, but it's his success through the MCU's Guardians of the Galaxy that elevated him from cult status and made him a household name. Volume 3 was always going to be an emotional moment for everyone, but the fact that Gunn managed to give someone like Rocket Raccoon such a deep, tragic backstory really took us all by surprise. This actually makes the final beatdown much more enjoyable, because you know full well that the higher evolutionary deserves what's being done to him. There was the obvious redemption arc for the Rocket, but it also served as a fitting farewell to a team that's always stuck together no matter what. Plus, the way things were going, this couldn't even be called a fight because Bro was completely dominated right from the moment Rocket counted his gravity attack right until the final blow from Gamora Part 2. Yet, yeah, it still feels weird seeing her after knowing the real Gamora's not coming back. Look what you did to me! Kill him. We have to get out of here. Okay, before the next entry, I want to shout out today's sponsor, Babbel. The biggest flex in the world of cinema is knowing multiple languages. So who better to go to than one of the top language learning apps in the world, Babbel. Babbel's helped me learn languages such as French and Spanish with such ease that I feel more like Mr. Worldwide than Pitbull himself. At this rate, I won't even need dubs or subs. But hey, it's not just me. Even science has proven that Babbel can help you speak a new language within three weeks. Also, actual language teachers design and curate their course, which means you're getting the best of the best. And if you're still not sure, they're also offering a 20-day money-back guarantee. I just went straight ahead with a lifetime subscription because c'est le meilleur choix, which is French for it's the best choice. See, I'm already reaping the benefits. Let me sweeten the pot a bit more by offering you 60% off on your Babbel subscription. Just click on the link in my description and become a master linguist. Okay, this isn't the Captain America we all know and love, but technically John Walker is supposed to be holding that title at the time of his sin, so my title is justified. Of course, that's not to say that Steve Rogers hasn't murdered people too. Bro is literally the X-Factor in World War II. However, the moment where Walker completely wrecks a flag smasher after losing his buddy was a bit difficult to watch, especially with the shot of blood dripping down the shield. This was probably the most impactful moment in an otherwise average show, and the overall tone of the scene perfectly captured the feelings of those who watched it in front of their own eyes. Like, I get it, bro. I would have been very upset too if I lost Lamar, but come on man, you can't smash a dude's face in broad daylight. What this sequence also did was highlight the effects of the Super Soldier Serum. Yeah, it doesn't give you Hulk level strength, but it's still a neat booster shot. Now the idea was obviously to put a political message across with this scene, but the reason I'm placing it here is because it finally brought some life to the show. I mean, there's only so much banter between Sam and Bucky that I can handle. Deadpool was always going to make it to this list because killing with humour is kind of his whole brand. Of course, I'm not only going to count moments that had a strong bearing on the movie, so the assassination of Francis totally deserves a spot. It's not even about the fact that Wade Wilson mercilessly puts a bullet through his skull, it's the way he totally ignores Colossus's lame speech about showing kindness and mercy. Like, come on bro, you're dealing with a guy who literally killed himself for choosing the wrong film role. Watching Colossus puke right after seeing this was pretty hilarious, and I'll give props to Deadpool for making the whole sequence seem so smooth. This does come back at the end of a pretty intense fight scene, so it's a bit of an anti climax if you ask me. Plus, to be honest with you, I found Francis to be an annoying prick. He didn't really stand out with his mutation. Like, okay, I get it, you can't feel pain, so you're supposed to be super badass or something. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Deadpool offed him because he didn't want such a boring villain to follow him in the sequel. I can't even tell you. <laughs> I deserve that. <laughs> that too. No, 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 maybe, maybe not the nethers. Start talking! <laughs> Oh! <laughs> 
Omni Man's by no means a Man, Apocalypse really is a very scary character. Bro lives up to his reputation of being a mutant god and proves it from time to time. The final battle was an excellent example of this as we got to see him fight multiple mutants at the same time without really struggling. Enter Jean Grey in Phoenix mode and all of that changes within the span of one business minute. Now this was a lot for someone as young as Jean to take because she does end up killing Apocalypse but desperate times call for desperate measures. The burst of energy that she releases is unlike anything we've seen before in the X-Men franchise and the fact that a mutant god couldn't handle it goes to show how dangerous the Phoenix can be. Bro even said all is revealed, which meant that he could sense the presence of a godlike force inside Jean. The visuals were on point and Oscar Isaac's acting really sold how devastated Apocalypse was when he got reduced to salt. Sadly, this is the same trigger that leads to the events of Dark Phoenix, but I'm only taking one movie at a time so I won't digress. <laughs> The God of Thunder may not have aimed for the head back in Infinity War, but he made sure to follow through in Endgame. Even so, taking down a weakened Thanos after he already got what he wanted wouldn't have felt fulfilling enough. That's exactly why I'm choosing the moment where Thor blasts Zeus with his own Thunderbolt in front of a live audience. Yes, I know Zeus is shown to be alive in the post credit scene, but he looked pretty dead here, and the God of Thunder most definitely struck him with an intent to kill, so I'll allow the discrepancy. What's really cool about this scene is the way Thor instantly grabs Zeus's Thunderbolt and throws it right back at him without any hesitation at all. He did deserve it, considering he zapped Korg in front of the titular hero. Man, when I hear the name Zeus, I think of someone epic like the version we saw in God of War. This dude right here was a freaking joke. What the heck is that skirt even supposed to imply anyway? Yeah, this is a death that no one would have argued with, so I don't really know why they chose to bring him back. Time passes by, I think everyone starts to reevaluate films that weren't as loved when they first hit the theaters. Take 2003's Hulk, for example. Nobody really enjoyed the movie during its release, but now with shows like She Hulk, it probably feels like an Oscar worthy masterpiece. There was a different kind of vibe to the movies that came out in the 2000s era, and even though the CGI may be questionable in this film, I'd still say that the primary plot was pretty solid. Of course, my focus is when Hulk kills someone, and in this case, it's his own dad, aka the Absorbing Man. It's a tragic moment that highlights the emotional implications of the outcome rather than some basic fight movement, and you know what? Ang Lee did a good job. The Hulk's repressed trauma and anger was just too much for the absorbing man to take, and it led to a rather eventful climax. The part where he says, take it all, still gives me chills to this day. It wasn't just the extreme gamma radiation and energy, but the intense pain and emotional scarring that did the trick here. Like even Thunderbolt Ross cared for Bruce Banner here, which is something I totally appreciate. falling as if you've been pushed off a tall building that was probably me <laughs> This is probably the only scene where Doctor Strange actually gets to flex his powers with success, and it happens to be against himself, or rather the sinister version of himself. I've always maintained that Multiverse of Madness was a shameless bait and switch, but that ain't gonna happen in this video because Wanda is a clear villain in this film. Yeah, I hope you're not expecting the Illuminati scene to show up at some point. Doctor Strange, however, manages to land a fatality when he pushes Sinister Strange through the window and to his end. The fight that really happens right before isn't exactly too fancy or amazing, but it was still pretty neat to see the Sorcerer Supreme fighting against an alternate version of himself. It's quite funny when he struggles to push the ball of chaos away, only for it to immediately return, making the whole sequence even more chaotic. The background score symbolizing this process is like the cherry on top of the cake. Sam Raimi does what he can to make the scene interesting enough for us, which is why it actually lands this high on my list. That weird third eye though is a menace and it creeps me out every single time I see it. I suppose we are both disappointed.
I really want to meet the guy who writes all of Vision's dialogues. That dude's got to be on a whole other level of philosophy. We all know that Vision is basically a physical version of Jarvis with an added dose of humanity. But bro's got some serious lines on him. Even when he decides to finish off Ultron, he decides to engage in some deep thoughts with his creator. Like, just listen to what he says here, it's pretty intense stuff. But the thing isn't beautiful because it lasts. It was also a full circle moment for Ultron because he had started off in a similar kind of body when he first came to life. There's just something about watching two robots indulging in serious philosophical thoughts before bidding farewell. I guess this is the future of AIA. Of course it ends with Vision blasting Ultron to smithereens, but it was a fitting end to a deeply confused villain. I also want to give Wanda some credit for ripping out the robotic equivalent to Ultron's heart from his actual battle armor. It feels like Vision really did steal her kill when she went through all that trouble to destroy the being that killed her brother. Try to control what won't be. But there is grace in their failings. Well, I was born yesterday. Everyone, guard the bridge. Elena, shut it down. We'll clear the way. Just you and me, Scourge. Optimus Prime may be all about keeping the peace, but his actions against his enemies sure state otherwise. Bro has this weird habit of turning into some psychotic robo-killer when he faces off against the main villains. Usually it's Megatron on the receiving end, but in Transformers Rise of the Beasts, Scourge was the one who had to face the music. It's not even like their fight scene was too long or anything like that. Optimus was just flexing on the dude for a bit before he totally violated him within five business seconds. Scourge couldn't even land one decent hit, and Optimus ended up ripping his head straight off his body like it was nothing. The part where he screams, time to show you the real power of a prime to show you the real power of a prime further establishes how much of a power difference there is between the two of them. I know this film didn't do well as the producers would have wanted it to, but man, Optimus Prime just keeps getting more and more savage with each passing film. Like, even the voice acting sounds a lot tougher than usual, even though it's still Peter Cullen who's blessing us with his legendary delivery. This belongs to a friend of mine. Now. Leave it to someone like Tony Stark to be able to kill his opponent mid-air without even being present at the scene of the crime. The fight against Sarvin was pretty impressive and I actually found it more appealing than the one against Killian because it just felt a lot more personal. We got to see a whole new side of Iron Man and it's not just because Tony was controlling his suit without being inside it. There was a genuine rage in his attacks and even when he launched the chest cannon on Sarvin, you could tell Tony was just waiting for the right moment to teach that hot-headed Baldy a lesson. There was no mercy on display here, although I should point out that Iron Man does save all the surviving passengers right after. It obviously came as a surprise when it was revealed that the suit was empty the entire time, but that doesn't mean Tony can't be held liable for the assassination. Luckily, Bro made sure he had a solid alibi just in case anyone came at him for his crime. Walk away from that, you son of a bitch. Oh yeah, I just love an epic fight to the death, especially when the hero wins with a move as thick as T'Challa's. The final battle between Black Panther and Killmonger had us all hooked right to the very end, so I've got to give props to the stunt choreography for keeping it so engaging all the way. This was such an impressive scene from a visual perspective, and I don't care what people have to say about the CGI on display, because it's miles better than what we've been getting in recent MCU projects. It's also fitting for Black Panther to regain his rightful title as the King of Wakanda, because, let's face it, Killmonger would have probably started World War III without any hesitation if he came out on top. Now, to is not the kind of hero who would shy away from taking a life, so I was totally expecting him to finish off his opponent when he landed that final blow. However, Bro decided to show some humanity which made me respect him even more as a character. Man, we really miss you, Chadwick. The title of Black Panther can never be taken over by anyone else. No, no. For my ancestors that jumped from the ships, they knew death was better than bondage. <sighs> Shazam. Don't 
don't worry, I've got DC scenes as well and some pretty amazing ones too. For starters, here's Black Adam literally tearing Sabak apart from what can only be described as the ultimate finisher move. Dwayne Johnson may have all sorts of clauses that restrict his characters from getting hurt, but this sequence definitely felt like a fair trade of blows. The structure of this final battle is nicely done as we see Black Adam tapping into his true powers to be able to land a fatality on his demonic opponent. Sure, he needs some help from Hawkman, who in turn needs some help from Dr. Fate's helmet, but the end's what matters, and it came out beautifully. Honestly though, The Rock should be strong enough to pull off a move like that with just his bare strength. Anyway, jokes aside, I personally love the way they chose to kill the main villain because it's so dominating and even sticks to the PG-13 guidelines. Man, I hope they somehow introduce Black Adam in Mortal Kombat or something. The horn split technique would make for an awesome finisher move. Never in my life would I have ever thought that Hawkeye would be a threat in any shape or form. The fact that he was able to make the freaking Yakuza piss their pants was a serious flex, I don't even mind the fact that he went on a killing spree as Ronin. He destroyed a whole gang using a sword and knives, whereas his opponents were firing at him with guns and stuff like that. And how can we forget the line, they got Thanos? You get me. It was so badass that it changed my whole perception about the character. Hiroyuki Sanada is an amazing performer and he looks super cool as the Yakuza leader over here, but even he was begging for mercy by the end of this sequence. The action choreography was top notch and I totally sympathize with Clint for what he does because Bro needed to deal with the loss of his family. It was a shame that we couldn't get to see more of him in a show that was literally named after him, but at least we have this scene. You can't give me. start my top 10 then we need a planetary level entry and that's exactly what I'm giving you with Silver Surfer taking on his own boss Galactus. Now we all know that the character design over here is far from impressive or even accurate but that shouldn't take away from the fact that Silver Surfer pulls out a god level move to assassinate the same dude who's built a reputation for munching on planets. The part where he mentions he's done serving Galactus is what gives me chills because bro was ready to give up on his own life as well. He's actually a very deep character so I personally feel there should be some kind of Disney Plus show dedicated to him. Anyway I'm glad that Silver Surfer survived the ordeal because these early 2000s live action Marvel heroes should definitely be brought back to the silver screen. I just hope the MCU sticks to the source material and doesn't mess it up the same way it's happened with all their other shows. Come on now. Is it really possible to talk about superheroes killing people without mentioning the freaking Wolverine? There are lots of scenes involving him on a murderous spree, but I want to give a fair chance to everyone else, so I'll pick the Berserker moment in 2017's Logan. The reason why I chose this scene over scenes like the X Mansion Assault or the Weapon X sequence is because it's a full circle moment. We see the Wolverine struggling throughout the entirety of this film, and now he finally gets to go all out one last time, even if it means he'll never feel this way again. The final slash was so animalistic and brutal that it instantly reminded me of the good old Wolverine we've been cheering on right since the year 2000. Yeah, these soldiers may have pissed their pants and lost their lives, but in my opinion, it's the perfect sacrifice for us to be able to witness magic. Man, I sure hope Hugh Jackman has some extra badass scenes in Deadpool 3. Why should boys have all the fun, eh? I've always been a supporter of women, especially if they happen to be named Gal Gadot. There's no other actress who can play the role of Wonder Woman in my eyes, and James Gunn feels the same way too, if the insider rumors are to be believed. Anyway, even a goddess like Diana isn't estranged to the concept of murder, because she slashes up Steppenwolf real good in the grand finale of the Snyder Cup. Now, I feel like I should mention that Superman pretty much does most of the work for her, but the finishing touches are still applied by Wonder Woman, which is why she gets the credit for this entry. I'm just wondering what must have been going through Steppenwolf's head when he saw an angry Gal Gadot coming at him with so much 
passion. I sure know what I would have been thinking if I was in his place, if you know what I mean. But you could never make the hard decision. You know what's better than Optimus killing one opponent? Yeah, that's right, it's him taking down two Apex Predators one after the other. The fight scenes preceding this were standard stuff, but I'm more interested in the kills because of how dominant they were made to look. Look, there's really no way Megatron was going to receive any mercy, even though he was lent an assist to his counterpart during his battle against Sentinel Prime. The way Optimus disfigures him with complete savagery was a top tier flex, and even his shooting of Sentinel was pretty ruthless. To be fair, that trader pretty much signed his death warrant with Optimus when he killed Ironhide in cold blood. When I first saw this scene, I instantly thought of Ironhide hide and all those other Autobots the Sentinel had killed. Karma will always find its way to you and in this case it came in the form of an overpowered Robo Giant. Frank Castle may not want you to call him a hero, but that doesn't change the fact that he's an absolute ruthless bringer of justice, even if said justice is a touch too bloody. The prison hallway fight scene is one of the most memorable scenes from the show, which by the way isn't even the Punisher solo series. This scene is actually from Daredevil, but at this point who really cares as long as the kills are memorable? Well, it doesn't matter what the franchise may be, but you can always be certain to see Frank bringing the rage with him, bro he's probably got more anger issues than the Hulk. One of the things I really like about this scene is how the narrow hallway legitimizes the whole bad guys running up one at a time trope, and adds to the authenticity of the choreography. What makes this fight scene even better is that it perfectly contrasts Daredevil's stairwell fight scene and together these sequences showcase both their battle styles and also their personal code when fighting evil. Open up! Kill him. V may not have the kind of superpowers that a Thor or a Superman may possess, but he's still a superhero because of the sacrifices he makes for the people of his land. V for Vendetta is one of the most impressive films I've seen when it comes to political drama thrillers. The final sequence where V not only kills Mr. Creedy, but also all of his security is one heck of a scene. The saying, never bring a knife to a gunfight, may be correct, but you should always be very afraid of the guy who knows it's a gunfight, but brings a knife anyway. It's not only about the way he physically takes down his opponents here either, just listen to his lines. Bro can make Vision look like an amateur in philosophy. Also, the fact that V still hasn't been a guest character in a fighting game is literally a criminal offence. It's a bit surprising to see Tony Stark in two entries on this list, but hey, if you're a genius, billionaire, playboy, philanthropist, then you've got to make sure your enemies are six feet under. In the case of the Gilmira scene from the OG Iron Man film, it's a simple case of rescuing innocent hostages and self-defense mixed up with a touch of personal vengeance. The scene also doubles up as the first ever test run of the typical Iron Man suit in battle mode, and as expected, we're all blown away, just like all those terrorists. Whether he was shooting them with his mini missiles and repulsor blasts, or, or even blowing up a freaking tank while walking away with extra sass, I think it's safe to say that Iron Man can make anything look cool. makes one more entry here, but it's not some badass murder that can be spoken of in a casual tone. It's the dreaded final battle of X-Men The Last Stand, where Logan has to use all his healing powers to counter Jean's Phoenix Force. We all know how this ends, and it's a rather emotional moment because the Wolverine has to live with the decision for the rest of his life. Now, the power he needed to use to be able to pull off is indeed impressive, but what I'm looking at over here is the impact it creates not just on the film, but also on the character. I'm sure Logan has regretted killing some of his targets, but Jean Grey is a whole other category, and Bro was completely broken after what he'd done. After all, it's not every day you need to to stab your ex in order to save the world.
Oh boy, how do I even present this seed? On the one hand, I want to talk about how poignant and revolutionary it was for its time, and on the other hand, I really want to crack a joke involving cracking body parts and Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man. Well, I think I should be nicer now, because killing Zod had to be one of the most regretful things that Superman has ever done. People can criticize the path Zack Snyder had taken with this seed, but let me remind you that everyone was talking about this after they saw the film. It definitely went against the general expectations, and it laid the groundwork for what could have been a truly epic franchise had the studios been more careful. Oh yeah, if you want 60% off on your Babbel subscription. A pluta. That's French for, see you later. Hope you liked the video, please subscribe to the TV region, and here's another video that I know you're going to enjoy.